Is your stock portfolio a mess? Do you feel like you know what you're doing, but you're not really sure if you're on the right track? Are you wondering if you're invested in all the right stocks? Do you even know what some of the companies you hold actually do? Well, today I'm going to talk about how to clean up your stock portfolio. I'm going to give you five things to look at for your own messy portfolios to get them tidied up and help you sleep better at night. We live in a world where stock advice is readily accessible on the internet. I just googled stocks to buy now and came up with a myriad of different articles telling me which stocks I should buy right now. And all these stocks are going to be different. So it's very easy to fall into the trap of buying something without doing very much research on it just because somebody told you it was a good stock to buy. And I don't think that's the best way to go about investing. So we're going to talk about how to avoid that pitfall today. But essentially what I've done is I've scraped together 45 stocks that the internet told me would be good buys right now. And I put them into a spreadsheet here. It's technically 42 stocks and three ETFs. So I'm going to analyze this messy portfolio that I kind of slapped together. And I'm going to give you five changes that you can actually implement if your portfolio is a bit messy like this and how to clean it up and get you feeling better about what you're invested in. Here are the five factors to keep in mind when cleaning up your portfolio. Step one is conviction. Do you still have conviction in the company? Would you buy it again today if you didn't already own it? Do you like the company or do you just like the product that the company makes? Step two is diversification. Are you prepared for anything? Are you willing to hold your stock portfolio through good times and bad? Step three is efficiency. Do you have too much overlap? Do you have some stocks that are doing the same things? Do you have some ETFs that hold stocks that you're already holding? Step four is competence. Can you really explain what the companies you're invested in actually do? Could you explain it to a child? And step five is fees. Are you paying too much for the funds that you're invested in? So we're going to look at all five of these things for this messy portfolio I've put together. So let's start with conviction. This one doesn't apply as well to this messy portfolio that I've put together because this isn't my actual portfolio, but I'll give you an example of something that happened with my real portfolio. There's a company that trades on the New York Stock Exchange called Unity Software. I loved this company. I thought it was so cool that they were offering a solution to help gamers make games more easily. Their software was being used for a majority of mobile games that hit the market. And I thought that this was just an amazing company to get exposure to mobile gaming. And I loved what they were doing. I was just a big fan of video games. And I saw that a lot of the games I was playing were developed on Unity's platform. And I thought, man, this company must be making tons of money because everybody's using their software to make games. And and video gaming is not going anywhere. So I rushed out and I invested in Unity Software. And well, I did really well. When I first bought Unity Software, they were trading around maybe $100 a share. And all of a sudden, Mark Zuckerberg changed the name of Facebook to Meta. And everybody believed that Unity Software was going to be the software that powered the metaverse that everybody was going to be using. Unity Software almost doubled up to about $200 a share. And I thought, man, I've just made some great money. I'm going to sell this stock and uh, never look back. So that's what I did. I sold Unity Software right around $200 a share and could not have timed it any better. That was exactly the top. So in the days following, Unity Software dropped and dropped some more and dropped some more and drop some more. And I thought, oh my goodness, Unity Software is so cheap again. And I made so much money on it last time. And now it's even cheaper than the first time I bought it. I may as well buy back in. So that's what I did. I bought back into Unity Software because I just had so much conviction on this company that was going to change the world with the metaverse and was being used by all of these mobile app developers. And at such a cheap price, how could I not buy shares? So I purchased shares of Unity at about $40 a share, and oh, it dropped even more. The company traded at about $30 a share, so of course I bought more because why would I not buy more? I kept buying more at $30 a share. Unity Software was making up a bigger and bigger percentage of my portfolio, and I was so excited about that because I knew as soon as the stock rebounded, I was going to make so much money on Unity Software. Well, Unity Software is now at $16 a share. This is a trap that anybody can fall into, and I'm sure a lot of you watching this video have fallen into this trap. Don't lie, you have definitely fallen into it before. You see a stock falling, you get so excited to buy the stock at a cheap price, you buy in, and it just keeps going down. So why does that happen? Isn't this a wonderful company? Well, I had so much conviction on this company because it made me so much money that I didn't really think to do any research when I got back in. I just thought, oh, this is the same great company that I know and love, and now it's even cheaper. But that's not always the case. The market is highly efficient, as proven by something called the efficient market hypothesis. So that just states that all public information is generally priced into the stock 
at any given time. Now that's not to say there aren't inefficiencies, and a lot of people make money capitalizing on those inefficiencies. But for the most part, you as a retail investor do not have any sort of edge on the rest of the market. Everybody else knows the same things you know. I'm really sorry to tell you that. So when Unity stock started dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping, Instead of my eyes turning into dollar signs and running out and buying the stock, I should have taken a step back and asked myself, why is this stock dropping so much? Because in reality, Unity stock has never turned a profit and their growth had begun to slow stall and eventually turn negative. So the financials of Unity were much, much worse than they were when I initially invested in the company and they were a fresh IPO loaded with cash and loaded with potential and possibilities. So that's step one, conviction. Would you buy the stock again today? Do you like the company or just the product? For me, I liked the product that Unity was selling. I didn't really know enough about the business and it turns out it wasn't a high quality business. It was just a product that I was excited about. So I urge you, especially if there's a product that you're very excited about, don't buy the company just because they have a good product, because a good product alone will not save a bad stock. You can have a wonderful product and terrible management, and that stock is not going to do well. And that's why there's things like activist investors, where somebody will get involved with the distressed stock in hopes of turning it around. But realistically, what you need to do is invest in these companies, not their products. So one suggestion I have for you to clean up your portfolio is to go through all of your holdings and ask yourself, if I didn't already own this stock, would I buy it again today? So for me with Unity, if I had done that, maybe I could have looked into what was going on with Unity and just pretended that I didn't already own the stock and said, hmm, what's going on with the company and would I buy shares? There's also something called the sunk cost fallacy, which states that when somebody already has money invested in something, they have a harder time letting go and cutting their losses because nobody wants to realize a loss. That sucks, right? Nobody wants to do that. However, it's important to know that every day is a new day and the money you have today is the money that you have right now. Even if you're down 80% on a stock, don't continue holding the stock just so that you're not selling at a loss. If you're just holding the stock so that you don't sell at a loss, that's not a good reason to be holding a stock. You should be holding a stock because you're excited about it, because you believe in it, because you love that stock, you can't wait to buy more, you believe in everything the company is doing, you're excited because there are so many stocks out there for you to buy. Why would you hold on to one terrible stock when you can put that money to use, even if it's not that much money, even if it's $100, you could still put that $100 into a better stock and $100 is better than $0 at the end of the day if that company goes bankrupt. So that's my tidbit. Uh, go through your portfolio, look at the stocks you're holding, and ask yourself, if I didn't own any of these stocks, would I want to buy them today? And that also comes down to valuation. There may be stocks that trade at a very high valuation. Think companies like NVIDIA, where they're still an amazing company, and they still probably have a wonderful future. But if you're holding NVIDIA, ask yourself, would I buy shares of the company today if I wasn't holding NVIDIA? If your answer is no, it may be time to trim. If your answer is yes, well, there you go. Keep holding and you can sleep better at night. All right, so that's conviction. Next, diversification, and we'll dive back into that messy portfolio I put together. So this messy portfolio has 45 stocks, technically 42 and three ETFs. So one would think it's very well diversified. But what I've done here is gone through and input the industry sector for each stock and the subsector for each stock. So there is a method of categorizing stocks known as GICs or the Global Industry Classification Standards. Essentially, what that is, is 11 different groups that stocks can fall into. Some examples of these groups are technology, which is things like software companies or electronics companies. There's a category called consumer discretionary, which are companies that benefit when consumers have more discretionary income. These are things that are not necessarily needs, but wants. There's a healthcare sector. There's an industrial sector, which is very broad, but essentially it encapsulates things like machinery, manufacturing, transportation. There's a sector called energy, but there's another sector called utilities. It's very easy to confuse those two. And a lot of people don't even realize that there's a difference. So what I've done with this messy portfolio of 45 stocks that the internet told me to buy is I've gone through and labeled the sectors so we can see if this stock portfolio is actually diversified or if it just seems diversified because there are a lot of stocks. Let's focus on this portfolio by sector. What we can see just by looking at this graph is that technology is the largest sector in this portfolio. That's completely natural because technology is also the biggest sector in the S&P 500. What I've done is I've put together a table of the S&P 500 sectors and their weight, 
and then compared it to this portfolio. If you'd like to do that, you can go to smpglobal.com, find the S&P 500 index page, and go to this sector breakdown on the data tab. This sector breakdown will show you how much of the S&P 500 is in each sector. So we can see that information technology, this sort of bluish teal bar, is about a third of the entire S&P 500. So if your portfolio is overweight technology, don't worry because so is the market. Okay, so we can look at this difference column. And this is something I used to do at my last job as a financial advisor. I would take people's portfolios, put them into a nice software, and tell them what sectors they're over and underweight in. For this example, I've considered an overweight or an underweight anything with a difference of about 5% versus the S&P 500. So we can see that our messy portfolio is way overweight consumer discretionary. We have about 18% of our portfolio in consumer discretionary, whereas the S&P 500 is only about 10%. So it might be worth looking at this portfolio and seeing if there are any overlapping consumer discretionary stocks that we can trim. Some other notable differences are an underweight to financials and healthcare and an overweight to industrials versus the benchmark, in this case, the S&P 500. So what we would want to do is go through and make sure we're actually diversified and not overweight on any sectors. These aren't terrible. At the end of the day, even an 8% difference is not the end of the world. It's not going to change much in the long term. Another thing to look at in terms of diversification is, are you holding enough diversified stocks? There's a generally accepted study that claims that anywhere between 20 and 30 stocks is enough to diversify your portfolio, as long as those stocks are not all from the same sector or the same type. It's important that these are actually very different companies, but here's a chart that shows your portfolio volatility versus how many stocks you have in your portfolio. We can see that as you get more and more stocks, between about 0 to 20 stocks, the volatility drops significantly. But from 20 to 100 stocks, the volatility doesn't really change much. So once you hit that 20 or 30 stock mark, adding more stocks to your portfolio doesn't really do much in terms of diversification. You can certainly own more than 30 stocks. Nobody's saying you can only own 30 stocks. But what I'm saying is that if you want to be diversified, anywhere between 20 and 30 is probably a good amount. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you own a stock, you're going to have to keep up with it. You're going to probably have to do some research on it every once in a while, maybe check in with it on a quarterly or annual basis. So if you own more than 30 stocks, you're going to find yourself checking in with a lot of different companies, and it's going to be a lot of work. For me, my career is in finance. I do analyze stocks for a living, so it's really fun. But even for me, I don't like to own more than 30 or 40 stocks. That would be getting to be a lot to keep up with. So that's diversification. With this messy portfolio, what I would probably do is go through and see if I can eliminate some consumer discretionary stocks and see if I can add to maybe the financials or healthcare sectors. What I also notice is that this portfolio doesn't own any materials or utilities stocks. So if I really wanted to be diversified, I would go out and find companies in those sectors. So that's diversification. Let's quickly talk efficiency. Do you have too much overlap? And well, this portfolio does. What I'm going to do is take these 45 stocks and sort them by sector. So remember how we talked about the consumer discretionary industry being a bit overweight in this portfolio? Let's see if any of these stocks overlap with each other. We can do that by looking at the subsector. Okay, so when we look at the subsector, we can see that this portfolio has two gambling stocks, Las Vegas Sands and Lottery.com. It also has two automakers, Tesla and Rivian. So my first instinct would be, do I really need two gambling stocks? And do I really need two automakers, especially when both of those automakers are electric vehicle companies specifically? So my rule of thumb is that you should always be investing in a leader. Now, it's difficult to say what a leader is, but typically a leader is a company that has a dominant position in the market. So they have a dominant market share. Maybe they are growing faster than their competitors. Maybe they have a superior product. It's really difficult to pinpoint what a leader is. But I think when we look at Tesla and Rivian here, I, I think it's quite apparent that Tesla is the leader. They have a larger market cap. Um, they do have better margins, better profitability, and they have a bigger percentage market share of the EV market. So if it were me, without doing too much extra research, I would say, maybe let's get rid of Rivian Automotive. Now, this is a very, very cursory investment analysis because I want to keep this video short. What you should probably do if you, this is your portfolio is do some heavy research and determine how these companies compete, how they overlap, and can they both succeed together? 
If they can, maybe you keep both. But for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to axe Rivian. That accomplishes two things. One, it makes my portfolio more efficient because companies in the same subsector are going to move together most of the time. So when one of them is up, the other one's probably going to be up. When one of them's down, the other's probably going to be down. So I don't really need to own both. I can get exposure to electric vehicles with just one. And that is going to cut down our exposure to consumer discretionary and make it a bit more in line with the market. Same thing with Las Vegas Sands and Lottery.com. Lottery.com is a very, very small company with an $8.7 million market cap. That's really tiny, and when a company gets that small, there's a lot of volatility. I don't really like to touch penny stocks for that exact reason. They're, uh, ironically, kind of like lottery tickets. People play in hopes of getting rich, but most of them turn into nothing. So I'm going to go ahead and say, let's sell Lottery.com. What we've done now is reduce our weighting in the consumer discretionary sector from 17.76 to 13.32. We're now much more in line with the S&P and we can go ahead and say that that is not a big difference anymore. So we've just accomplished two things. We've made our portfolio more efficient and we've improved our diversification by making it a bit more market-like. Let's do that with one other sector because I noticed technology was also a large sector. And look at this, we have one, two, three, four, five, six different semiconductor stocks in this portfolio. The internet really wanted me to buy semiconductor stocks. I can't imagine why. It's not like semiconductor stocks are extremely popular or anything, right? So we own apparently Broadcom, NVIDIA, Taiwan Semiconductor, Micron, AMD, and Intel. These semiconductors all kind of have their own specialties, but a lot of them compete with each other. When we think about data centers, Broadcom, NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel all sell products for data centers. The internet also told me to buy Supermicro computer, which, while it's not technically a semiconductor company, is a data center company. So we have a lot of overlap, and I'd say this portfolio has a lot of exposure to data centers. Do we really need all that exposure? Well, maybe. If you're extremely hyper bullish on that sector, maybe you want to keep all those companies. But for me, if I wanted to try to diversify this portfolio and make it a bit more efficient, I don't think we need so many semiconductor companies. What I would do is find out how these companies compete and where they differentiate themselves. For example, NVIDIA and AMD are both fabulous semiconductor designers. So what they do is they don't actually manufacture the semiconductors, they simply design them and outsource their manufacturing. So for me, those two companies are quite similar, and going back to that leader's example, I'm going to go ahead and axe AMD. Now, again, you're going to have to do some research because AMD might be a superior company, but for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to try to keep things brief and we're gonna cut that out. What I also might do is cut out Intel because they're not necessarily a fabless semiconductor manufacturer. They do also have their own semiconductor fabs, but we also own, apparently, Taiwan Semiconductor, which is the largest semiconductor fab in the world. So I don't think we need to necessarily own both because I don't see any extra exposure that we'd be getting from Intel that we wouldn't get from TSM. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pretend we'll sell Intel here too. Okay, now instead of six semiconductor companies, we only own four semiconductor companies, which is still a lot, but hey, you know, it's a very, very broad industry and uh, maybe it makes sense to own that many. What you could also do is consider looking into a semiconductor ETF. If you really can't decide what semiconductor company to buy, but you want exposure to the industry, there are some great semiconductor ETFs out there. One of them that I like is the Vanek Semiconductor Industry ETF. The ticker is SMH. All right, let's move on. Competence. Can you explain what this company does? And can you explain it to a child? In order to demonstrate competence in a particular subject, it's really important to be able to teach that subject. So you might think you know what a company does, but if you can't really teach it to somebody else, maybe you don't actually know what the company does. Warren Buffett only likes to invest in companies that he understands, and I think that's a really great rule of thumb. So when we go through this list of companies, there are a few that are really unfamiliar to me um, because I didn't actually put together this portfolio, the internet did. But what I might do is say, hmm, Emerson Electric. Well, I've heard of Emerson Electric. They're an electric company, right? That's not going to give me a pass on any kind of graded test. If somebody asks me, hey, explain what Emerson Electric does, and I'm going to grade you on an A to F grade scale, I would probably get an F by saying it's an electric company. So for me, I don't know what Emerson Electric does, and I would not invest in the company until I can fully understand what they do. So let's just pretend we're selling Emerson Electric. What I do is go through and pretend like you're teaching somebody about your portfolio. Go through all of the list of names and tell somebody what this company does 
but you don't actually have to call up your friends and tell them. You can just talk to yourself like a crazy person. Say something like, Alphabet Inc. owns Google, which is the world's largest advertising company. They also have ventures in self-driving cars, robotics, and they have a dominant AI large language model. They're also very well known for their Google search engine, which is used by billions of people. Okay, that's a very good broad definition of what Alphabet Inc. does. It's not the perfect definition, but I think it's enough to say I understand what Alphabet does. I'd be comfortable holding Alphabet. I'd encourage you to go down your portfolio and make sure you can give a brief, simple explanation of what the company does. If you can't, I would do one of two things. One, research the company a bit more and find out what they do and see if you really do still want to hold it. Or two, just sell it and then do some research and see if there's any other companies that might be better suited for your portfolio. Finally, we're gonna talk about fees. Are you paying too much? There were three ETFs that the internet told me to buy. And honestly, good job internet because these are pretty solid ETFs. We have VOO, which is a really fun ticker. V is the Roman numeral five and zero zero, 500 for the S&P 500. I never really understood that until recently. But VOO is an S&P 500 ETF. We have VIG, which is a Vanguard Dividend ETF, and VFQY, which is the Vanguard US Quality Index ETF. So essentially, they try to pick companies with strong competitive advantages, right? A history of quality. Well, one thing to know about Vanguard is that they are historically low cost. But let's go out and take a look at maybe this VFQI and see what kind of fees they're charging. Maybe this is also a good time to tell you that uh, ETFs and mutual funds charge you a fee. You'll never see it because they take it off of the performance each day. So it's a bit of a phantom fee, but you are paying a fee anytime you're investing in an ETF or a mutual fund. Okay, so I simply googled VFQI ETF. What we can do is go to the ETF provider's website, in this case Vanguard, and what we're looking for is either a prospectus or an expense ratio listed. What's nice is Vanguard lists the expense ratio right here, probably because they're very proud of it. A 0.13% expense ratio is incredibly low. So essentially, every year I'm paying 0.13 of my investment to Vanguard in the form of a fee. That's low enough where I'm not too worried. However, if you start to see an expense ratio above 0.5%, we call that 50 basis points, I would maybe start to shop around for other alternatives because a fund's expense ratio really does impact its performance over the long term, and oftentimes the best performing fund is the one with the lowest expense ratio. So make sure you're not paying too much for your mutual funds and ETFs. Another quick note about this is that the internet told me to buy the S&P 500 ETF, but the internet also told me to buy companies like Alphabet, Amazon, Tesla, Microsoft, Apple, and Nvidia. These companies are all a huge component of the S&P 500, so my portfolio is not terribly efficient holding this Vanguard 500 index ETF. Do I really need to hold an ETF that also holds the companies that I'm already holding? That doesn't make a ton of sense. Essentially, I'm over-concentrating on those five companies. So what I would do if this was my portfolio is I would either sell VOO or I would continue to hold VOO, maybe make it a bigger percentage of my portfolio, and I'd sell Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, Google, and Amazon because I'm already going to own them through the Vanguard 500 index. I'll quickly search VOO ETF to tell you what I'm talking about. Here's Vanguard's website for VOO. I click on it. What we're gonna look for is portfolio composition. Sometimes they call this holdings, and we can see the top 10 holdings of the fund. Microsoft, Nvidia, Apple, Amazon, Meta, Google. We can see that as a percentage of the fund, those stocks are the largest percentage in this fund. Even though the fund has 500 companies, Microsoft is 7% of the fund. If every company on that 500 list was 7% of the fund, you would have a fund that's thousands of percent. So Microsoft is way overweight in this fund. So I see no reason to own VOO and also own Microsoft. Pick one or the other, man. Just pick one. So let's just say we're going to go ahead and sell VOO. You technically could make the argument that, yes, maybe it makes sense to hold the S&P 500 and big tech because the S&P is more than just big tech. But what I'm saying is that the S&P is so overweight big tech that you would really want to think twice about owning both the individual stocks and the ETF because you really are doubling up your exposure. If you're really bullish on big tech, then that's fine. But if you maybe aren't as bullish and you didn't realize you had so much exposure to it, that might be the time when you want to sell. And again, none of this is meant to be financial advice. I'm simply giving you some guidelines on how to clean up your portfolio should you want to. At the end of the day, it's up to you to decide what stocks to buy and what stocks to sell, and I hope that you do your own research and come to your own conclusions. So these are my five steps on how to clean up your portfolio. Make sure you have conviction in all the stocks you hold. Make sure your portfolio is diversified. So as soon as the market goes south, you don't want to start questioning what you hold. You want to start questioning what you hold now so that you're prepared for when the market goes down. Because, spoiler alert, it will go down. It might go up first, but some days it will go down. 
Efficiency, do you have stocks and funds that are doing the exact same thing? Do you need to have both those things? You might, but maybe you don't. Competence, do you understand what these companies do? And fees, are you paying too much for the fees you hold? These are my five tips on what to look for to clean up your portfolio. And thank you guys so much for just watching the video and sticking around for this long. I know it was a bit of a longer video today, but I really appreciate your support in checking out the channel, and I hope you all have an amazing day.